please do come and take a seat. We are coming today on another gloriously sunny day to worship our glorious God and to hear from his word, some quite challenging words uh, for us as, as his people and as his church. Um, but we're grateful, aren't we, to be able to come uh, to worship um, and to praise him together. Um, I was thinking of these words from Psalm 95 as I thought about us drawing together this morning. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So let's do that. Let's sing for joy to the Lord and praise our King, the God of heaven, in King of Kings, majesty. So let's come before our great God, the great King above all gods, as we pray together. Our Father God, it is amazing that you would invite us to come before you, the great King above all gods, who is enthroned in heaven with all majesty that you would invite us in to worship you as God, as Father, as Lord, the one who loves us and watches over us, that you, the maker of heaven and earth, would be concerned about our lives, the week that we've had and the week that is ahead of us. Lord, we're so grateful that you are close to us even like our closest friend, that you are there to listen, that you are there 
to support, to encourage, and to help us through life. How we're grateful for your love, O oh God, that you have indeed ransomed us, paid the price that was needed to bring us back into this amazing friendship that we have with you. Thank you for Jesus who made that possible. And Lord, we long to, to live to serve your majesty, but we don't always get it right. So we come this morning to confess our sins. When we lost our patience this week, when we weren't kind, maybe we were envious of others or rude or put our own interests ahead of others. God, forgive us for these things. We're so grateful that when we come and confess our sins, you tell us that our sins are forgiven. And you robe us again in these amazing clothes of righteousness, taking off all those terrible, filthy things that we've done and giving us instead this royal robe. Thank you. All within us really does cry out in praise this morning. And so, Lord, help us to know this joy of being forgiven as we continue to walk the way of love that you showed us in Jesus. Now let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. For as we have been forgiven, so we also would want to forgive others. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, it's uh, school holidays today, so um, I think, Jonathan, you might be having a one-to-one -one session in Sunday school, which is wonderful. All the questions you could have ever thought of asking, you can ask them today. Um, and if you, if you want to move, because I'm going to have to stand here for the camera to do this next bit. So if you want to come and sit in the front, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, today in Sunday School, Jonathan is going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, because um, they're going through the book of Philippians at the moment. Um, and these are amazing verses uh, about the way in which, as we've just been singing and thinking really, um, God humbled himself and came down to be our closest friend. Um, and so in order to help us remember those verses, I want to use a piece of paper, okay? So if we could have the verses up on the screen, thank you. So here's Philippians 2, just a bit of it, verses 5 to 8, where Paul writes, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So here's how you can remember it. We should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who although he was in very nature God, he was equal with God. Straight line at the top of the paper. Although he was equal with God, he humbled himself, so we just fold like this. He humbled himself and came down to heaven, uh, came down from heaven to earth. And then he took on the nature of a servant. So if we fold that again, we can create a nice little bowl. And instead of being the king of kings who was served, Jesus became the one who served us um, and served other people with this lovely cup. Okay, so he humbled himself, took on the nature of a servant. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even further, so we make it even smaller, 
and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. His body was torn and broken for us. Let's see what we've got left. We have a cross. And the cross reminds us that we should have the same attitude of Christ Jesus, who though he was in very nature God, he humbled himself, became a servant, even obedient to death, death on a cross. And when we see a cross, we know that that's our example to follow. Now, the verses don't stop there, and hopefully in Sunday school you'll be looking at that next bit, which is when Jesus comes back from the dead and is exalted to the highest place. Um, But there's a cross to remind us that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Do you want to learn how to do that? Yeah? Um, There are a few pieces of paper on the chairs. Just go and grab a piece of paper. Nice and COVID-friendly, this. Um, And if any of the adults want to do it with me, uh, there are a few other pieces of paper here. So um, do feel free to to grab one of those. Okay, so remember where we start? Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he humbled himself. So we turn the first fold like this so that we create a nice angle down yeah so to the top right corner fold it across excellent we got that and so we can now see that God humbled himself Jesus came down from heaven and then he became like a servant. So we fold it again now that way to make like an arrow. Yep, that's right. Yep, fold it that way. So you, you've now got a little arrow. And that also opens up into a cup to remind us that Jesus became a servant. Okay, fantastic. Now we fold it one more time over like this to remind us that Jesus took on the appearance of a man, became even smaller, if you like, that's it. And then he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And now we rip on the long edge from about two centimeters in and rip down in a line like that. And then if you open that up, you'll have the cross. There you go. Well done. Give Jonathan and his helper a round of applause. Very good. Now there's a second part to that, which I might show you some other time, that uses these bits. Okay, now to just uh, remind us again of how amazing this love is, we're going to sing From Heaven You Came. Helpless babe, the servant king. Let's sing that together.
know. One of the interesting things about looking for songs that talk about how we love one another as a community of God's people is that there aren't very many of them. Um, and uh, Stuart Townend and Keith and Kristen Getty uh, found this a few years ago and they wrote this beautiful song that we're going to, uh, to sing together. Um, the music group will play, the, uh, play and sing the first verse and the chorus um, and then we'll, we'll pause. I'll invite you to stand um, and we'll sing together. It's called Oh How Good It Is and I love the third verse which we'll sing in a little bit. Oh how good it is to embrace his command to prefer one another, forgive as he forgives. When we live as one, we all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. But let's have the first verse and the chorus with the music group to, to teach us the song.
as we come to our prayer of intercession together this morning, so that we can share it and make it more personal, make it our own, at several points you will hear, Lord, in your mercy, and you will say, hear our prayer. To be absolutely clear, when you hear, Lord, in your mercy, you respond, hear our prayer. Now let us pray. Holy Lord God, our Father in heaven, we come together now in faith and unity at your throne of grace with confidence seeking help for all those in need, weeping with those who weak, weep, seeking strength for those who are weak and grace for those who are troubled in body, mind and spirit. The psalmist spoke of being surrounded by trouble, being troubled on every side. And Lord, we are aware of a world full of trouble and we have to choose who to pray for just now. And we would begin today, the second day of Ramadan, praying for all who will be keeping the fast, keeping it, yearning to find your forgiveness and your presence. We ask, Lord, that you will speak into their hearts and reveal Jesus and his saving grace to them, even in places where your name goes unrecognized and in places where this impinges negatively on your believing people, grant your people your protection. Give them your love for their fasting neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, there are so many countries where life for your people is dangerous one such being Afghanistan, where the Taliban have declared death to all Christians. Lord, we ask for you to watch over them, to protect them, so many of them already fleeing for their lives to neighboring countries. Similarly, we would ask also for your protection for Christians in Myanmar, equally vulnerable to attack. And all those suffering in war-torn Yemen and those in South Sudan traumatized by the longest running and most brutal civil war in Africa. And Lord, now the folk in the state of emergency in Sri Lanka. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And our Father, we do not forget the appalling, seemingly never-ending war in Ukraine, constantly before us on our television screens and in the papers, with daily danger and nightly danger from shelling for the fear, the loss, the suffering, the homelessness, lack of food, shelter and basic amenities. We cry to you, Lord, with urgency that you will bring an end to this conflict. We pray for protection from danger, for the provision of necessities, and for pastors to minister your care and compassion in this need. Thank you, Father, for all who are working towards these ends. And we thank you too for the Bibles and New Testaments being published and distributed by the Ukrainian Bible Society to army units all over the country. May there be an openness there to the gospel message. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we come closer to home, we pray about the influx of refugees to Western Europe, praying for the countries involved and indeed refugees and people, displaced people throughout the world, but praying that all the countries involved in receiving these people, ourselves included, may be able to provide shelter, to supply the necessities of life, counselling and care, 
and sharing your word where possible. And Lord, we pray too for our own population. So many reeling from the skyrocketing increases in the cost of living while they're already struggling to make ends meet. And seemingly now for some to have to choose whether to be warm or to eat. Grant, Lord, that those of us who have enough and to spare will willingly share what we have and provide to meet these needs. As your word instructs us, we pray too for our government and all those in authority. Many of, of these seem to make decisions which look to be ill-advised and certainly contrary to your ways and also seemingly little integrity or trustworthiness. Lord, restrain them, direct them to wiser ways for the nation's benefit and for your honour. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, last but in no way least, we would pray for ourselves here in Sandiford giving thanks for the freedom we have to gather to worship, for fellowship, and for mutual help and support enabled by your grace. Amongst our number, many have particular needs, and we do pray for those who are unwell, for those who are struggling in various ways, and those who are weighed down by troubling situations. Lord, draw near to each to reassure them with your presence and your provision. And we would remember those who are on holiday at this time, particularly bringing before you our minister Ben and his family on holiday. Lord, that they may be rested and refreshed and renewed. And we pray too, Lord, that as a congregation, we might be a beacon of light and hope to those living and working round about us here in this area. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord God our Father, we bring these our prayers to you with confidence in your promises to hear and answer. And we pray above all that these folk we have named before you, that they may seek you, find you, rejoice and be glad in you, for you alone are there and our help and deliverer. And now we pray, believing you to be able to do far, far more than we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour in whose name we pray. Amen. And now we will sing together the hymn, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God, continuing our worship.
Thank you, Pamela, for leading us in prayer. There is so much to pray for. Um, it's lovely to dwell in God's presence together. I don't know if um, you watch TV from time to time or whether you look for these shows, but um, you'll find often there's a program on um, listing the nation's favorite something or other. And often it's a countdown from 50 or maybe even 100. Uh, but it might be the nation's favorite Beatles song. It might be the nation's favorite poem. It might be the nation's favorite chocolate bar. Um, and there's usually wild disagreement among friends about the results. Snickers was the nation's favorite chocolate bar. <coughs> really? <laughs> now, if we were to guess what the nation's favorite Bible reading for a, re a wedding would be, I wonder what you'd say. 1 Corinthians 13, thank you, Fee. And actually, the wedding section of the Church of England website confirms this. The number one most popular reading for weddings is dot, 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 1 Corinthians 13, exclamation mark. But if you've been on the Sandiford website to see what the topic for this week is, you'll have noticed that Ben's short but snappy title for 1 Corinthians 13 is Not About Weddings. Actually, we were talking in the week, uh, Ben and I, and, and reflecting on the fact that Paul would probably be quite surprised that this passage has become such a favourite at weddings, because it's not really written for a husband and wife. Although, of course, the love that we're about to read about is wonderful if we see it expressed between husband and wife. No, this is a passage about love in the church. And actually, as we thought last week, um, 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 um, are kind of a, a unit that help us think about how we as the church should operate, um, and with particular reference to spiritual gifts. Paul didn't write these words to Corinth so that they and we might we read them at weddings. He wrote them so that they and we might understand that love is absolutely fundamental to the way that we should live worship and serve as a community of God's people. So let's read them with that in mind. And in fact, to help us with that, I'm going to read in from chapter 12, verse 27, uh, to, to set the scene a little bit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 through to 13, verse 13. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, 
they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, every part of it given to us for our instruction, for our encouragement, to challenge us to live as you want us to live, and even rebuke us when we get it wrong. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and be our teacher this morning as we look into this amazing chapter about the kind of love you want to see among us. Amen. I had a thought actually that I should have done the first phrase of chapter 14 to also indicate how much this fits in the middle of a wider section in the first letter to the church in Corinth because Paul goes on to say eagerly desire gifts but follow the way of love. Um, and, and if we read on as we will next week we'll see that um, Paul wanted this chapter on love to be the center point of this section on gifts and worship and service in the church. Chapter 12 is about gifts, as we saw last week. Chapter 14 is about gifts, as you might have seen on the screen for the title for next week's sermon. Chapter 13 is about love. It's a love sandwich, if you like. Spiritual gifts are great, says Paul. You should eagerly desire them, but the way we use those gifts is far more important than the gifts themselves. So in chapter 13, Paul shows the Corinthians the way, the most excellent way to live, worship and serve, the way of love. And chapter 13, I think, is a, a, in itself a love sandwich. The first few verses about how we use our gifts, and there's an, an exhortation and encouragement here to make make them count so that we're not in a situation where there's nothing left after we've worshipped together. And then the last few verses are about the relative importance of gifts when we think that love is eternal. And in the middle, verses 4 to 7, we have those famous verses describing the kind of love that Paul was expecting to see in the church in Corinth, and we can say the kind of love that God expects or wants to see among us as a community of his people. For we too are called to follow the way of love, to make our gifts count, to help the body grow, and to create the kind of environment where outsiders go, wow, these people really love each other. I want to be a part of that. So what does Paul have to say about love in this chapter? Well, two things really, I think. The first is love, don't leave home without it. And secondly, love, don't do life without it. And you may recognize those headings because I've stolen them from American Express, who use them in their marketing campaigns. But I think they summarize things beautifully for us. Now, American Express, um, they obviously used it in the sense of you shouldn't leave home without one of their credit cards in your pocket because you never know when you might need it. I'm not sure when they changed that slogan, don't leave home without it, to don't do life without it, perhaps during lockdown when people weren't leaving their homes anymore. I'm not sure. But it's an interesting tweak. And when it comes to the church, Paul might have said exactly the same thing about love. When you're going to church to use your gifts, don't leave love at home. 
When you're doing life together as a community of God's people, don't do that without love. You see that the Corinthians, they loved their spiritual gifts, but they often weren't so keen about loving each other. And so Paul has to remind them that without love, gifts are actually meaningless and pointless and worthless. Look at verse 1. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I can speak in as many different tongues as I like, says Paul, but if I don't have love, I'm just this monotonous, annoying sound. You see, the sound of the gong and the cymbal would have been familiar to the people in Corinth. They were used in the city's pagan temples and they were not nice sounds. We shouldn't be imagining the, the sound of the big orchestral gong. For those of you old enough to remember the rank movies where the guy smacks the gong, which was actually made of papier mache, and the sound reverberates beautifully around your living room or the, the cinema. No, it's a clanging sound made on a copper gong. Similarly, the cymbals were not the cymbals we hear in the orchestra when the piece of music reaches its crescendo. They were really annoying. Just imagine the sound that annoys you the most. Is it a car alarm going off? Or that beeping that a lorry makes when it reverses? Or a dog yapping again and again and again? Whatever it is, imagine that. That's what it's like when we use our gifts without love. But love is essential in, in exercising all our gifts. In verse 2, Paul talks about prophecy and teaching and bringing a word of knowledge and says, if I have these gifts, even if I have a faith that can move mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. I notice in this section that Paul writes in the first person. He was applying this to himself, as well as asking the church to follow this way of love. So even Paul, extraordinary apostle, missionary, and church planter, says, I am nothing without love. And it's even the same with the gift of giving. Look at verse 3. I could give everything I have away to bless the poor and, and even sacrifice my own body, says Paul, but without love, I gain nothing. We can have all the spiritual gifts in the world, but without love, it's all blah, 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 as Greta would say. But Paul makes another point about gifts and love in the last few verses of this chapter. Because the Corinthians appear to have, been, have made having and using spiritual gifts the be-all and end-all of the Christian experience of, of being part of a church. And they'd actually forgotten that the gifts that God gives to his church are temporary, whereas love is eternal. So love must always be the most important consideration for us in everything we do. Now Paul's been quite blunt with the church in Corinth on a number of occasions. Um, and here again, I think he seems to be telling the Christians to grow up. Their obsession with particular gifts, just like their allegiance to particular teachers earlier on in the book, it's really quite childish. Now, I don't know whether you remember this in your childhood, but I'm sure this happened on more than one occasion with me. You got a gift from somebody, and your first thought about that gift is, it's mine. And you are really pleased with it, and if it's a toy, you want to play with it. If it's a, a, a CD or a, a tape or a record, you want to listen to it. It's yours. You don't want to share it with anyone. But as you grow up and you receive other gifts, as you mature, you realize that these things are to be shared and enjoyed by other people around you. It's part of growing up, isn't it? To have that perspective on what we have and what we're given. Now, Paul wants the church to grow up and put childish ways behind him. He says in verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put childhood behind me. He wants them to adopt this more mature perspective that love is more important than gifts. 
Now, as we saw last week, all of us, every believer, has been given a spiritual gift which is to be used for the common good. So we don't ignore the gifts that God has given us. They're given for the building up of the church, for the extension of God's kingdom until Jesus Christ returns. And Paul hints at that here as well, doesn't he? When perfection comes, or completeness, as it is in our reading, when perfection comes and we see God face to face, we'll have no need of the gifts of the Spirit. We'll know everything fully. We'll have no need of prophecy and tongues and knowledge and all the other speaking gifts that we might list. But until perfection comes and we see God face to face, we need these gifts. Because at the moment, it's like looking in a mirror. Now, don't think about the mirror that Paul talked about as the mirror that you looked in this morning before you left the house, which gave you a beautifully crisp, sharp image of your lovely, wonderful faces. The mirrors in Corinth, unless you were super rich and got the best, the mirrors in Corinth would have given you a very blurry kind of image. It's not really a crisp image that we see today. When perfection comes and we see God face to face, we will have no need for the gifts because we will see everything crystal clear, really sharply. But of course, until that time comes, we need the gifts to help us as a church. So the challenge for us is to use the gifts God gives us properly with love and to keep the right perspective on these things. Love never ends, says Paul. So let's make sure we make love the priority. So when it comes to using our gifts in the church, it's all about love. Don't leave home without it. But also, says Paul, when it comes to being the community of God's people, it's also all about love. Don't do life without it. So the big story this week, apart from the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine and the energy price rises, occurred at the Oscars, where Will Smith hit Chris Rock after the comedian made a joke about Smith's wife and her medical condition. Now, there have been countless tweets and news reports about this incident. You may have followed them, you may not. But most of them took the, the line, quite rightly, that Smith's uh, behavior in striking rock like that was unacceptable and inexcusable. Smith, of course, has apologized. And, and in one of the statements, he used this phrase, I am a work in progress. And Smith's moment of failure in the, very, in, a, in, in the public eye, in a very public place, I think that highlights the challenge that we all face in living up to the standards that we set for ourselves or, as those who follow Jesus, the standards that God's word set for us, the way of love. When we read those verses earlier, verses 4 to 7, at the heart of this passage, did you think to yourself, that's not me? And if you did think, yeah, I'm really good at that, then you probably didn't get a good score on the pride one. This is the kind of love God wants for us as his people. A love that is patient and kind. There's no place for boasting. Not just individually, but as a church. Love's not rude or self-seeking. But love protects, trusts, hopes and perseveres. I think of these verses as a three-dimensional love, and there's a challenge to this, because the standard is so high, isn't it? We're called here to love despite ourselves and our human nature. We're called to love despite what others do to us, and sometimes people can be quite provoking. And we're called to love despite the outside circumstances which we have no control over at all. Because we're not by nature patient and kind. We, we do find it easy, don't we, to be jealous of other people or proud of our own achievements, to be a bit self-absorbed. And rude or unkind or unhelpful words slip so easily out of our mouth before we know it. And then there's this challenge of, of loving others. Yes, people can be annoying, but love is not easily angered. 
Our natural instinct might be to keep a record of wrongs, to hold grudges, but love forgives and forgets. It's so easy to be interested in and then captivated by the evil that other people get up to, whether that's real or fictional. But when things get unhelpful and unhealthy and unholy, love switches off the TV or shuts down the app or tries to change the topic of conversation which others are enjoying so much as they rejoice at wicked things. But love, love gets excited about the truth and rejoices when good things happen and justice is done. I have had a really challenging week. I have to say there was a point this week after I'd lost my patience and maybe not been very kind um, and was beginning to resent a little bit that I remembered I was preaching on 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> it's challenging being a believer in this world with all the pressures on us and yet we want to follow this way of love. I love Karl Barth on this. Um, he said, love cannot alter the fact that he gets on my nerves, but it can rule out my allowing myself to be provoked by him. We used to say, you know, if you were losing your temper, you should count to 10. I don't know if any of you did that. People provoke us, we don't need to respond. Can we find a way to step back from it, to breathe, and then make a better response? And the final dimension is that love, the love we have, the love we have for one another, it's not or shouldn't be dependent on outside circumstances. True love always protects, regardless of what's going on around us. True love always trusts when we have no idea what's going on. True love always hopes, even when problems appear insurmountable. And it always perseveres through the fiercest drought and storm. It's not easy, but this is the way, the most excellent way. And it's what Paul wanted to see in Corinth and it's what God longs to see amongst us. And so we have to ask the question, how, how is this possible? Where can we find help to live up to this standard? As I looked at this passage this week, I found a really helpful comment about the, the language Paul uses. Um, when he wrote these words, he's using verbs, obviously, but he's writing in Greek in what they call the present continuous tense. Now, I have no idea really what that translates to in, in our way of speaking, but here's what one commentator wrote. This denotes actions and attitudes which have become habitual. All these things have become like habits. They're things we can learn. We can become more loving as we allow God to help us. And that, that really encourages me, because it's not like Paul expected the church in Corinth to suddenly put everything right overnight and become this beacon of, of light and love in the city. But he wanted them to get good habits, to love more as time went on. He wants them to try. At the end of 2 Corinthians, he'll write, aim for perfection. He doesn't say at that point, be perfect. Aim for perfection. Last week we were reflecting on the idea that to be a church is to be unified or, or at least to always be seeking unity. And I think Ben said something like, or was he quoting Andrew Wilson, and since it is unlikely that we'll achieve perfect unity this side of eternity, it's the pursuit of unity that counts. And we can say the same thing about love. <coughs> Our love for one another will never be perfect while we struggle with ourselves, with others, and these outside circumstances that we can't control. But we should always be seeking to grow in love. In some senses, progress, not perfection, is our goal. And so I looked at myself this week and I said, well, I taught on this passage to the young people at Scripture Union's base camp in 2019. And actually, I preached on this passage in Sandford back in 2010. Am I more patient and kind and loving and forgiving with other people around me now than I was then? Because that would be progress, even if I don't get it right every day. 
And to help us with this really challenging three-dimensional love, we do, of course, have a three-person God. So when we think about ourselves and our weaknesses, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, helping us to love others despite ourselves, transforming us into the likeness of Christ. And then we have the example of Jesus to help us when we struggle to love others. What was he like before those who accused him unjustly? Like a sheep before the shearers, he was silent. And when it comes to the things we can't control, we can still love because we can trust in the sovereignty of our Father. We have a three-person God to help us with this three-dimensional love. And so as we finish, I wonder if there are aspects of love that stand out for you today. That as you look at the, the church around you and the people you live with and serve with, you want to be a little bit more patient with someone. Maybe you were holding a grudge and you need to let it go. Maybe you need to speak to somebody and put that right. And maybe there are other things in our lives we delight too much in the evil of this world. We make excuses for it. But God's asking us today to put that right. Or maybe you're on the point of giving up with someone or with a situation. And God's saying today, just keep going in love and trust me. One of those habits that we could form that might help us could be just to pray Holy Spirit, fill me today with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And make that a daily prayer. Isn't that amazing how the fruit of the Spirit matches up so closely with what we would expect to see as we love one another with the Spirit's help? So let's encourage each other and pray for one another as we want to see you, as we continue to work towards progress in our love and our attitude towards our gifts. Amen. We're going to sing um, a hymn called Let Love Be Found Among Us to close. Um, it, the tune, I think, will be familiar to you. It's uh, come there, Fount of Every Blessing. Um, the words are from praise. And again, they're, they're wonderful words. Um, that help us to reflect on this passage. Uh, the third verse, um, how deeply God has loved us, accepting us as friends, so let us show each other this love which never ends. The, the tune, um, as we sing, you'll notice that as, as we go through that the first word of each line is sort of slightly extended um, so in order to, to fit the words to the tune. So it's, let it love be found among us, and so on. That might help you just catch the meaning a little bit more. So let's stand together and sing, let love be found among us, a love from God alone, the hallmark of the children whom God delights to own.
The benediction is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for perfection. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.